Alright, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start a little bit quickly because the last talk went over by a little bit. So let us just jump straight into it. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. That's the kind of response I want to hear for a curriculum talk. Alright, so today we're going to be presenting Whose Idea Was That? And this is going to be an overview, a comparative overview of security curriculums and also accreditations compared to industry needs. My name is Chaim Sanders, for those of you who don't know me. And my co-presenter over here is Rob Olson. And this isn't even our final form yet. Yeah. As we keep going, we're going to talk to you today about computing security education, something that really enthralls and invigorates most people. Now, the first question you should have here, although many of you know us, is why are you guys at all qualified to be talking about this type of stuff? So both of us are professors here at RIT. If you're not quite sure where you are right now, this is the Rochester Institute of Technology. And uh, interestingly enough, we both kind of socially engineered our way into computing security education. Rob came originally from computer science, and yep. I came from industry. This is a little bit of a strange situation because they've pretty much given us the keys to the kingdom here, where two of us sit on the four-person compu computing security curriculum department uh, committee. And what we do on this committee is we steer curriculum. Right? This is pretty much a self-explanatory name. They, they came up with it. It's pretty good. Now, we represent two of the people. The other two are Bill Stackpole, who chairs the committee, and then Alan Kaminsky, who is uh, the computing science representative on the committee. And this is going to be kind of an interesting situation. Now, the one thing that we want to note is that the only association we have is with RIT. That means that we're not associated with things that we'll be talking about, like ABET, or ACM, or IEEE, or the NSA, or the CIA, or the DOD, like any of these things we're not really associated with. But we're going to continue to talk about them in spite of that. So we had a couple of questions that we came up with while we were doing this research. Uh, they went pretty straightforward. The first is probably the most obvious. Why do we care about computing security education anyway? Why does this matter to us? We have some ideas on that. The second and third come, kind of go together. If you were to start a program, where do you put computing security? Where does it go? Does it go directly into computing science? Does it have its own degree? And are you even going to teach it? Right? You could be a smaller school and say, this is too much. If you do teach it, what topics are you going to cover? What, how do you know what you're going to teach? And who, who dictates that? Does anyone dictate that? Are there standards here? That seems like a pretty good question. And of course, the last question is uh, kind of the most interesting question. Based on what people are teaching, can we say something about the jobs that those students are best equipped for? And our assertion is going to be yes. Essentially, if we were to TLDR this, the question is, when was the last time you thought about who's behind a computing security curriculum? And what does that mean to you as non, let's say, students, or at least non-professors for the most part? Well, well, even for students, right? Yeah. Because the kind of program you're in is really going to sort of influence where you head in industry. So the first question we have is, why do we care about security? And, uh, and we have this kind of like classic notion, which is just like, there's this huge lull of computing security experts for the amount of jobs we need. And interestingly enough, we're going to see that there's like no data to back that up. There's just like this assertion, uh, which is kind of cool. So this data is from the Department of Bureau of Labor and Statistics. And you should note that this is uh, probably not going to be right. It says there are 90,000 information security analysts. Now, this is probably due to the fact that this is a very specific job title. Right? This doesn't include anything else. The definition of security is a little bit tenuous. We have no clear definition as, hey, is that system administrator also doing security? We don't know. Um, so this, this becomes kind of an interesting data. The other interesting data we have here is obviously that it's growing. Regardless of what data you see, we're going to see that there are more jobs to be had. So there's kind of some questions you have here. And the questions go around the fact that, if there's 90,000 people who are doing computing security, that, can't, that seems low, right? That can't possibly be right. That would mean that one out of every 4.5 people in this room attended DEF CON last year. That's probably not right, and that's not even accounting for people who came from outside of the US that went to DEF CON, there are 20,000 people who annually attend. So are there other number sources? And it turns out, yes, there are, but they're extremely sporadic at best. So we have, for instance, the currently employed U.S. goes between 780,000 and 1.7 million. Now that's a pretty large discrepancy there. And including when we took, take a look at currently employed, we have between 4 million globally and 6 million globally. 
That's almost as large as the discrepancy of the amount of illegal voters as Donald Trump said that there was in the U.S. election. <laughs> yeah, it was a good one. It, was good. it goes both ways. Yeah. Uh, cool. So we have a kind of a question here. Clearly, there's a lot of jobs, right? We, we don't really know how many jobs, but can we make some assumptions about that? And if we can, does it matter how many students we have? So then we have to have a question about how many students there are. No data available for that. However, since we work at RIT, we at least have RIT's data. Probably the yeah. most troubling fact that you'll run into is that academia doesn't publish any of this data. Zero. None. Yeah. So you don't know how many students there are, how many programs there are even in computing security, and we're going to talk about accreditation and whether or not that exists. So we can definitely say that there's one thing that we have going for security. Academia tends to do what we call market-focused education. And that means, in other words, it seems like those people are going to be able to get jobs afterwards. And if they can get jobs afterwards, I can put that statistic on my website. So we should definitely do this. Yep. Which means that there's a lot of computing security uh, departments. Now, we've highlighted some here. But the problem is we have no basis for this. Right? There is no comparative criteria for the quality of computing security programs. These are just people who did well in CCDC, which is not even really a particularly effective metric of computing security. So we have this kind of interesting question of where this data comes from, who's the most reliable, and how many students there are. So what we can do is we can take a top data point. right? We can put a boundary on this. And we can say, it is unrealistic that every school has, let's say, 120 people per year graduating with a computing security degree. I think we could all agree about that. If we did do that, we have this nice equivalent. So we say three out of four people, which actually is much higher than I anticipate, or much, a much higher graduation success rate, uh, graduate every year if they've gone in. So one, uh, three fourths of people who go into a program finish it. That's a pretty good rate. That seems pretty nice. So we take that number and we assume that there are 137 schools. This is kind of the minimum number that we can get here. Uh, this is from the CAECD. We're going to be talking about what this alphabet soup means in a little bit soon. So if we multiply that all together, we get that there are 90 students per year who are going to be going to 137 different schools at most. And that's going to give us at most 12,330, uh, 12, which is a wholly unrealistic number, but it's an upper bound. That seems pretty good. Based on our numbers, though, how many students do we need? Well, we have this kind of interesting case. The lowest number we had of total jobs right now in the US was 1,128,377. Very specific number. Um, so if we assume that people work for 40 years, give or take, you know, who knows, uh, we can divide this by 40, right? And then we could get the current amount of people that you're going to need if you started today to fill all those jobs, which essentially means, although it's not a really realistic number, it's probably front loaded. Uh, there's probably more security analyst positions than there are CISOs, but yeah. we can use this information. If we took this extremely liberal approach, this would mean that we need 28,209 students per year to be graduating. All right, so we're clearly not fulfilling this goal. Even with this low ball number, unrealistic class size, and the lowest estimate of uh, computing security experts in the field. That's kind of nice. In fact, we can verify that this is somewhat the case because ISC squared only has 73,000 members in the US. So we can kind of say that we're probably pushing at least a good amount of these per year through. This, this is maybe right, but we don't really have any data to prove this. This is the best we have. Are you including military kind of stuff in here also, or is that just? The, these estimates come from various different sources. So the ones that you saw here, uh, right? Did I just pass that right yeah. here? come from these different sources. They have different criteria for their inclusion, but almost all of them do include the DOD as part of their kind of yeah. lifestyle, but not the US military, because that's the largest employer on the planet Earth um, at 5 million people. Cool. So we went through all this data, which was really nice. And then we kind of came up to this, how do we evaluate these security problems? How do we evaluate our security curriculums? Well, this is actually an interesting situation. We have kind of the academic approach. And our, one of our arguments is that this is a major driver of where computing security uh, workers come from, is academia. I don't think this is a crazy argument to make. 
Uh, we can certainly say there are other sources. No one's disagreeing with that. Training on the job, certifications maybe, military training, all of these factor in. But we're saying that this is a large factor. And if it's such a large factor, we should really, really focus on those 12,000 or so that we actually make. How do we assure ourselves that we give them the best security education we have? Because we're clearly already short on the number of students we have. So with that in mind, we're going to jump into each of these sections uh, where we would fit computing, sci uh, computing security and computer science, information technology, and information system. We're also going to discuss some of the current trends within academia accreditations. Now this is to say that generally majors have an accrediting body. Someone who says this is the minimum curriculum that you're going to need in order to offer this course and get our approval. Sometimes people even ask, like parents will come in and say, who accredits you? In computing security, there is no accrediting body at this point. We're going to discuss the possible contenders for this location or this title. And, uh, and then we're going to go into some proposed solutions and our recommendations on the matter. So it's also worth uh, thinking about how this accreditation process goes. So in terms of the, the accreditation, where does the accreditation actually get its information from to accredit people on? Well, as things stand right now, that's coming from the, uh, uh, largely from the ACM curriculum. So the ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, publishes these curriculum guidelines and ABET, uh, I don't recall what that stands for off the top of my head, comes in and says, yes, you're meeting those, roughly with a little twist here and there, or no, you're not meeting those. Uh, so ABET accredits. Now, we're going to talk about NSA. NSA is kind of playing in the same space a little bit. They're not an accreditation. They're a designation, which has some, different, some implications for colleges. I guess you can't technically say your program's accredited. It's designated instead. Um, so yeah, so let's jump right into this by taking a look at ACM curriculum guidelines. So for ACM curriculum guidelines in computer science, this is what we end up with. Now this is ranked in credit hours. So we have two kinds of credit hours for, I'm sorry, not in credit hours, in instructional hours. We have tier one instructional hours and tier two instructional hours. Tier one instructional hours labeled T1 are mandatory hours. You have, to, you have to be in a room with a professor either doing uh, either in a lecture, a lab, or some other similar setting for these tier one hours here. T, uh, tier two hours are hours that you should ideally have, but ACM doesn't actually expect you to meet those. Okay, so some relatively high percentage, 70 to 80 percent ballpark is kind of what's expected there. Notice this makes sense for computer science. So software development fundamentals is actually pretty high up on the list. Uh, some things that don't make it so much sense for uh, security, which is a place that we'll see AC, uh, where, uh, so we'll see that CS is a place where security often ends up, three instructional hours. Okay, so that's three lectures. It, from the ACM's perspective, in order to be a computer science person, you have to have three lectures in college on security. Three hour long lectures. Okay? Ideally, you'll have a total of nine hour long lectures, but that, that's sort of it. In fact, if we take a look at where this ranks overall, this is one of the lowest knowledge areas for ACM computer science standards. Okay? And here we have a breakdown of those hours. So, this is largely geared towards uh, developing secure software. Now, if we think about as security people, all of the things that we need to know about developing secure software, uh, you know, everything about OWASP, everything about how web application stuff uh, gets exploited, everything involving buffer, o buffer overflow exploitation, we're supposed to cover that realistically in two hours. Okay. Uh, then we also have a little, uh, a few extra things thrown in. You should know some knowledge. Of, you should have some knowledge of threats and attacks. That's one optional hour. Uh, you're supposed to learn everything you need to know about crypto in one hour. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so that can't possibly be right. Okay. So to put this from a perspective, you know, to sort of toss our experience as instructors into the mix a little bit. So. 
we have, as I said, this is measured in instructional hours. That means we're sitting in a room with people for about, um, well, so we're in a room when we teach a class for about 45 hours a semester with students. Okay. From security, uh, we're saying that there are, so this usually ends up three instructional hours for 15 weeks. Um, some CS topics, we kind of hit that, right? So the software development fundamentals gets, gets kind of close to that at 43 hours. Uh, we already sort of drew up on this point about, uh, th about three to nine hours on security, which means really three to nine one hour lectures. That's all you get as a computer science student of security in your curriculum. That means one to three weeks, okay, and one to three assignments, maybe one project. Uh, now, in terms of how this ends up being translated, most CS programs to satisfy these requirements have a course to KU mapping. So when we have something like software development fundamentals, okay, we'll say that that's 43 hours. Well, that's almost an entire semester. So we'll say that's going to be a course. Okay, so when we have mand uh, when we ha have uh, knowledge units with a high number of required credit hours, that ends up being a mandatory course. Okay, so software development fundamentals, that's your computer science one class. Okay, or your computer science two class, or it might be split up a little bit. Okay, so those end up as required courses. When we have low cont or uh, low number credit hours, or I'm sorry, low number required uh, our instructional hours, those end up as elective courses. Okay, so you might have a security class as an elective that you won't be required to take, and it doesn't have to be too intense because they're not, ex ACM isn't expecting you to come out knowing that much about security anyway. Uh, this gets a little bit interesting uh, when we actually look at um, some other places. So in terms of how we break this down, okay, how we actually break this down, um, we do see, so the, uh, what we have here are the security, are, are the content of a suggested security curriculum. Now notice where this kind of lies, right? Uh, in terms of instructional hours per semester for, a, a, um, for an elective security class, uh, it's very heavily geared towards application security in blue. Okay? What we see less of is IT security in purple. So we end up with about maybe nine hours, uh, about nine hours or so, or eight hours in, uh, in IT security, and much more of the semester ends up being in, web, uh, in uh, application security. Okay? Now, IT is a little bit different. So ACM has a separate designation for, program, uh, for uh, IT degrees. They have a separate curriculum recommendation for IT. And it's actually very different, right? One thing that's nice to see is that information security and assurance is, has a fairly high number of uh, required instructional hours. Right? So this is a positive thing. There's also some security, uh, security adjacent um, topics here. Integrative programming, there's usually a lot of, or, uh, there's usually a lot of security covered in that. Since, as we all know, this is one area where um, things, where uh, a lot of security problems arise. Social professional issues, that's also a place where security and security adjacent topics get talked about a lot. That's your ethics, your uh, societal implications of technology, etc. Lots of those are security focused these days. So all in all, this seems like a much more security focused curriculum. Okay. And if we take a look at uh, I, the IS curriculum, uh, so we what we have here are marked are classes that are marked uh, where there is some security content in the class. Now, they, uh, for the IS curriculum, it doesn't break uh, it doesn't break the curriculum down into inst into the number of required and optional instructional hours in the same way that CS and IT have, but it does. We, do, we can look at syllabi and figure out how much time in these courses is supposed to be dedicated, or roughly speaking, how much time in these courses is supposed to be dedicated to security. Now, we see security in a lot of places in these syllabi, which is nice. 
because it does mean there's going to be a lot more reinforcement. Okay? We don't necessarily know quite how much time each one of these is going to cover. We, we would have to make some, S, some guesses. Uh, but this is nice, a nice reinforcement of uh, security, even though it's non-technical security, or less technical security, I should say. Because it's an information systems degree, you're going to have less hands-on, more things like auditing, more um, larger discussions of policy, that sort of thing. So what we actually see here, are, I've got a couple of sample courses. So we have IT security. Uh, this very much tracks what we would expect in sort of an introductory security class. We also have a second uh, class here, IT audit and controls, that hits a lot of the same notes. So again, lots of reinforcement going on. Uh, and for someone who's going to be in a policy position or a, a non-technical analyst position, this makes sense, right? Uh, but in terms of how ABET actually does its accreditation, so this is where we see a little bit of a disconnect. So ABET is, ABET ha, there's a loose association between ABET and ACM. Okay, in that a, ABET, as I said, they kind, of, um, they kind of follow the ACM curriculum most of the time in their uh, accreditation guidelines. You'll see a lot of the concepts are very, very similar to what, uh, to what ACM uh, to what the ACM recommendations were. Notice that in the computer science section of the ABET requirements, there's no security. Security is not mentioned. Students never have to take a security class. And these are people who are going to go out and become developers, right? Why do we see, I mean, if we take a look at some of the stuff that's recently been going on, why do we see the same bugs coming up over and over again? This is how we get bugs. Uh, in terms of their actual learning outcomes. So the way that ABET works is they, they have their curriculum guidelines, and those are supposed to map towards learning outcomes, things that students are supposed to be able to do when they graduate. So here we have a general ABET learning outcome. Now this applies to all ABET programs. Okay? Every single ABET program has this particular one, uh, this particular learning outcome, which does mention security, okay? but you have to have an understanding of security. All right, that's very broad. Okay? And that understanding of security means something, that's a, means something very different to an IS person uh, than it does to a CS person or an IT person. Okay? Uh, if we look at what else CS has to do, uh, mathematics, algorithms, etc., uh, science degree, and then also you have to be able to apply it. You have to be able to apply design and development principles. So it would be nice if, this had, if there was some learning outcome here related to security for CS. But what this is really saying is that ABET doesn't actually care if a CS person can apply security in any way. And uh, in terms of learning outcomes, these often pop up for colleges in what we call assessment. And that's how a program manages uh, measures its success or failure, okay? Periodically, we have to go through and see, you know, look at how students are performing on particular assignments, particular tests, et cetera. And those assignments or tests map to these learning outcomes. For CS, there is no learning outcome for security, which means no one's assessing it, which tying this back to the point I made earlier, or maybe this is why we don't have any data on it. Uh, for IT, uh, this is a little bit better. Okay, so here we have the the actual required curriculum for an IT degree for ABET to accredit the IT degree. There has to be some coverage of information uh, information assurance or security. All right, so this is good. All right, this is probably a class in IT assurance, IT uh, security, something like that. Okay, so IT. Definitely a step above CS in terms of prioritizing security. At least, at least the courses they have to take include a security class. Um, if we look at their learning outcomes, though, uh, so we have, again, something about applying current technology. Okay? We have something about uh, analyzing user needs, which makes sense. If you're going to be in IT, you should be able to think from a user's perspective. 
We have one about um, integrating. Okay. We do have one requiring uh, sort of discussing best practices and standards. If we're going to measure security, uh, if we're going to have a learning outcome that measures security, this one probably makes the most sense. But at the same time, it is tangentially related to security. It doesn't explicitly say that students coming out, out of an IT degree have to be able to do security. Instead, they just have, have to do best practice. Hopefully, best practices are connected to security, but that's not always the case. Uh, and then uh, assistant creation creation of project plans, so a little bit of project management there. IS, again, IS, like IT, references an explicit, uh, references security as a specific area that we see things covered, okay? However, it is, it's one of many, and certainly an IS degree is gonna be less technical than a CS degree or an IT degree, okay? So here we have a discuss. here we would expect to see discussions of policy, discussions of auditing, compliance issues arise, those types of issues, which is not bad. Uh, it is what we're preparing, you know, it is a different mindset, okay? Uh, but that's not a problem. I mean, that's, that's an important part to a functioning security, security ecosystem in a company, as much as some of us might not be, might not find that quite as interesting. Uh, and then when we look at the learning outcomes for those, again, no mention of security, right? So we're expecting students to take security, to take a class that covers security content, but um, we're never measuring it in any way. When we actually look at who does what, okay, when we actually look at who does what, the breakdown of who is covering security uh, in different places, we see that this is sort of interesting. Most students are getting security in CS. Right? Now, we're, we're tracking this by looking at uh, the numbers for NSA designations, largely. Okay? And for uh, schools in C uh, and for schools uh, competing in CCDC. But most of the schools providing T uh, either getting NSA designated or going to these kinds of competitions are coming out of computer science, the place where we just said no one has to t ever take security, really. Okay? That's an interesting trend. Okay. Some of the places where we would expect to see it, if we take a look at IT, um, you know, IT is actually fairly low on this list. Okay. Similarly, um, CSEC, it's nice to see CSEC as a big chunk of the pie, uh, but there's some weird results too. Computer engineering. We don't necessarily expect to see computer engineering as producing a large portion of security, uh, security people, but that's actually what we do see when we look at who's getting who's getting these designations. Yeah, so um, again, this kind of drives home. If we're thinking about who's getting security and where they're getting it, it looks like most people are trying to get their, C their computing uh, science uh, programs to be their security programs, which kind of, again, drives home this point of what are these gonna, people going to do out in the field when they actually have to um, be doing security? Uh, so, did you want to talk about this? Yeah. Yeah. Can I do this? Yeah. So in the past slide, we actually just saw a breakdown that included all the NSA CAE, all the NSA CO, all the NSA CAER, and all the CCDC schools. That's a lot of letters. What do those letters mean? That's the real thing that we care about today. So one of the most interesting things and the most widely used accreditation is actually this NSA designation. And it is an NSA designation for a variety of different potential areas. So when we start talking about CACD, this is the most common one. There are 140 schools that have a designation of CACD. In its previous form, not the current ratified form, but the form that almost all of these schools have, that requires that there is a program that can be made from the entire institution that fulfills the requirements that we're going to talk about in a couple seconds. Really, at its previous form, it's an extremely high-level security program. There's no requirement that people are able to even physically take these classes, just that they exist. In the current 2016 iteration of this, you have to be able to actually take this. And we're going to talk about how that might be done. However, as you'll see, the topics are still fairly high-level. C 
DACO is the newest accreditation that you could possibly, I'm sorry, newest designation that you could possibly get from the NSA. And this is actually heavily focused, at least in our opinion, which is why the stars are there, on state-sponsored offense. And we'll see why we have that feeling as we go forward. The last one is the CAER. And interestingly here, this has no correlation to any academic classes. This is all about whether or not you can actually publish research. You have a research institution that has PhDs, so on and so forth. Now, there are times that you'll overlap these. So for instance, 39 institutions have both a CAECD and a CAER. There's 170 institutions that have at least some of one of these, but more, the most popular one by far is the CAECD, and there's only 67 that have the CAER, and there's only 13 that have the CAEO right now. That's going to be really interesting when we start talking about what these curriculum requirements are. So they have some specific needs in order to take some KUs, like we saw before, knowledge units. Uh, but for the most part, you can either be a two-year designation or a four-year. We're only going to consider the four-year for right now. And there's, uh, the four-year has the requirement of both the two-year schools and uh, the four-year schools additional with some additional knowledge units. So what we have here are the requirements for, uh, for the CAECD. Okay? These are require, required knowledge units, not optional knowledge units. For the four-year, uh, for the two-year program, they have to take everything on sort of the left side of this graph, uh, the things that we would expect to see, data analysis, some scripting, some networking. On the right side, we see the differentiation between a two-year uh, a two-year program that's accredited with CD, or I'm sorry, designated with CD, and a four-year program that's designated with CD. Uh, more of a focus on defense, more of a focus on theory, including operating systems, which we're going to come back to. Uh, probability, uh, databases, weirdly, I guess that doesn't hurt, but it's a little bit of a strange choice. Now, these are the required knowledge units. Everybody who graduates, uh, for, in the current iteration, everybody who graduates from a CAECD program has to, has to hit these marks. Okay? That was not previously the case. Previously, these knowledge units had to be offered somewhere in the institution. Okay, which means that a computer science class that your IT student or a computer science class in operating systems that your IT students could never even take because they didn't meet the prerequisites for would count towards the previous iterations of CAECD. It's a strange view, right? You you can have this class and that's all that matters. You don't actually care if any students ever take it. Now, in thinking about CAACD and what it's geared for, too, we also have to look at the knowledge, uh, the optional knowledge units, because these required knowledge units give you a nice baseline. Okay, the optional units, knowledge units for this are crazy broad. Okay, and uh, students graduating with the CAECD have to be able to take any five of these. Okay, that is, the school has to have five of these somewhere in their curriculum. Okay. That fits every, basically every program out there. We see things like fraud prevention that might make sense for an IS program. We see things like software security analysis, uh, secure, uh, secure programming, uh, OS hardening, operating systems theory. They make more sense for a computer science program and certainly IT. We even see things in here such as hardware, firmware security that make more sense for a computer engineering program. We start to see why there might be more computer engineering. Okay. Uh, and when we move into CAE, uh, CD, when we actually look at what their learning outcomes are, remember that these are the things that are supposed to be measured. There's nothing too crazy for CAECD. Okay. Here we have the requirements for an int uh, the required learning outcomes for an intro uh, for an intro to cryptography class that an undergraduate student is supposed to be reasonably uh, is supposed to be able to take. This is their takeaways from that intro uh, intro to crypto class. So for example, students will be able to describe which cryptographic protocols, tools, and techniques are appropriate. Makes sense. That's not crazy. Seems like something a four-year student should be able to do. OK? Uh, and then, yeah, pass this time. So the newest member of the NSA designation team is the CAECO, which stands for Cyber Operations, if we recall. Now, these are some interesting requirements here. Uh, <laughs> so. There are 10 required KUs within this space, and at least some of them seem very highly geared towards, shall we call them, government individuals. For instance, how many of you 
needed to learn about the Hague or, Hague or Geneva Conventions to get your job in security off the ground. Probably not many of you actually you know, engage in war-level efforts. Uh, there's also something interesting missing from this core group. Does anyone see where the ethics is? <laughs> seems, an seems maybe an appropriate choice for... Uh... For, yeah, for a government-level agency, perhaps. Now, there are some optional ones as well, and the interesting part about the optional ones is they're very specific to things that you might not necessarily need. Now, some of you who are in the professional world might do reverse engineering of hardware on a day-to-day -day basis, but for the large majority of people who are going to leave school, you probably aren't going to need to be able to do low-level microcontroller design as part of your day-to-day. -day. Now, this kind of drives an interesting conversation and a theory about why some of these might be in here. It is my opinion, although it's not necessarily one that can be condemned by everyone, that some of these courses were put in here for specific schools to be able to achieve this accreditation. This is an extremely strict definition of what these things are, as my dear friend Rob will yeah. tell you in a couple of seconds. Yeah, and, and just to also drive home for that, uh, for that last slide, schools have to be able to hit 10 of those 17 areas. Okay. Uh, so learning outcomes for CAECO. Uh, there are some things that make sense, right? So if we, th if we think back to the crypto one that we saw a minute ago, that makes sense for a two-year, uh, for a four-year undergraduate student, okay? <laughs> if we look at what CAECO has, we have some things that also make sense for a four-year student, an understanding, of, uh, an understanding of operating systems, okay? A thorough understanding of how operating systems work, the theory behind them, et cetera. Students should be able to implement significant architectural changes to an existing OS, Okay, I guess, I guess that's, I mean, that makes sense. That's not a bad thing for students to know. Making architectural changes, I'm not sure how many people do that on a day-to-day -day basis, but they should come out of college knowing how to do that if they needed to. If they got into that position, they should be capable. Okay? Uh, so this makes sense, I think, as a learning outcome for the operating systems class. Although it does make this feel more CSE, if you will, or computer science -y. There are some that are a little, a little strange, a little specific, okay? So here we have one of the learning outcomes for the mobile knowledge unit. Uh, the requirement where the students know how to, uh, it's a knowledge unit, cellular and mobile technologies. So students must, basically the students need to be able to trace a packet end to end, you know, from start to finish in a mobile network. Okay, there's a lot of protocols in there that many people aren't going to be using on a day-to-day -day basis, particularly if we think about mo how mobile integrates with a uh, plain old telephone system, okay? But this certainly wouldn't be bad for students to know. A student who could do this should be pretty, re should be pretty good to move into a networking position, okay? Uh, and then there are some, for lack of a better <laughs> word, that are batshit crazy. So here we have the assembly language and low-level programming. Uh, knowledge unit. So if we read through this, what it says, students need to be able to implement a standalone program, uh, a standalone networking program such as Telnet in assembly, and hold on, wait for it, no external libraries. Okay? A four-year student needs to be able to write Telnet in assembly with no libraries. That means no drivers, no Windows utilities, none of that. Who would do this? Who would need to do this on the day-to-day -day basis? Like, on a day-to-day -day basic basis, except TAO, right? What security analyst needs to do this on a day-to-day -day basis as a part of their regular job, particularly at an intro level, right? This, this only makes sense for NSA. Um, so when we look at how things are changing, okay, when we look at how things are changing, so NSA is kind of the dominant player in the accreditation space, even though they don't actually offer accreditations. Okay, they offer designations, which is a little bit different when you talk to deans and vice presidents and so on and so forth. Okay? Um, ACM and ABET and IEEE are kind of looking to move into this space. So they started this thing called the Computer uh, Cybersecurity Engineering Project uh, to look into the problem. It's formed by a group of people at multiple institutions. And uh, ACM is basically using this group's work to create a joint task force for studying cybersecurity education, which is about the most academic thing you can say. Okay? 
we're using your work to create a joint task force to, to analyze whether or not we need to do more work. Um, what this is going to do is it's going to end up being the basis of this of what's probably going to be an ABET accreditation for cybersecurity called CSEC 2017. This, by the way, is the ACM name for this, not the ABET name for this. We don't know what the ABET name for this is yet. Uh, ABET is, has their computer accreditation committee looking into this. Um, they're basically going to end up implementing, uh, implementing, probably implementing the CSEC 2017 that we'll talk about in a minute. But they are going back and revising the previous the, the stuff that we previously showed you. So they're, they're in the process of revising those accreditation uh, requirements for CS, IT, and IS. Interestingly, also, um, yeah, so interestingly, the Engineering Accreditation Committee is looking into this as well. Uh, but they're not publishing any of their work. So the engineering, the, the group that, the, the group within ABET that certifies engineering programs is also trying to move into the cybersecurity space, but their stuff's not available yet. So it'll be interesting to see how this goes. There's one reference to, one reference in one two paper or two page uh, presentation description that says EAC is also looking into this. Um, so the ABET revisions. So largely speaking, what we see is that ABET is actually pulling security out even more than it already has. Okay, so uh, the um, within CS, for example, we, uh, so within the uh, within the general curriculum requirements, we don't see that it specifically references security anymore. But we do say that.
that it seems like we don't have a very good representation of yet. Additionally, uh, we're seeing accreditation finally move more towards, or we ex at least assume that it is moving more towards industry-based offense, which is kind of a nice area that we've been lacking. Our recommendations for this space are kind of very interesting in that sense. So first off, there's no metrics anywhere. That would be a really nice thing to make available so that we can know how we're doing or whether or not these are effective or you know anything at all. That would be cool. Uh, certifications should be used. Now, when we say certifications, this is an academic term. Yeah. You can get a certificate in a particular degree. And in that space, we say things like, I have a certificate in information assurance. This will become important for the CAECD now that you can't just have it anywhere in the institution. What they're going to say is, this is the path that you can take in order to get this certificate. Probably no one will still take it, or very few people will, but they'll at least have this capability. As a result of this, we'll probably also see a slight shrinking in the amount of CAACD accredited schools, I would assume. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, there's a couple other options here that are kind of nice. Um, when we start talking about CAECD, probably with the new requirements, our IT and our, I, our CSEC are probably the only curriculars that will actually have the requirements. So for instance, if you're mandatorily needing to take a system administration class and a networking class, CS is probably not going to cut it for you. That's not usually in CS uh, curricula. Now, the other kind of caveat here is this masters versus minors business. The minor makes a lot of sense. However, there's a problem with a minor and why we see it so little. Minors need to go through state. Certifications, don't. Colleges can just do whatever they want and just say it's a certification and it's fantastic. Now we see a lot of masters actually, and there's a really good reason why we see a lot of masters, or at least a really good conjecture. First off, masters are fantastic because you can just say, we have a masters program, come see us. That's great. Another aspect that many of you may or may not be familiar with is that masters cost more money. And as a result, schools really like masters. That's a really ideal opportunity for them. They also don't require you to have as many prereqs in across the board general education and they only take two years or a year, depending on your situation. It's a really great solution, uh, at least from the school's perspective, and I think we'll see it more, regardless of whether or not it's the best solution for the student. Now, when we still start talking about the NSA CACO, it actually, based on its really deep dive into operating system concepts and some of the other concepts we see, best fits a computer science or computer uh, engineering degree, and it almost certainly doesn't fit an information sciences degree, an IS degree. And of course, we, uh, we kind of see this business where we see kind of offense slowly picking up, but we are going to predict that uh, just because the NSA CAECO doesn't necessarily meet the accreditation needs or the needs of industry, that we'll see at least some other type of accreditation or, or kind of uh, designation emerge. So uh, with that in mind, I think we're going to transition to some questions if we have a couple minutes, which we have maybe a few minutes. Are there any questions? It sort of seems like the ACM and these other sort of accrediting bodies have a lot of uh, say over dictating what like a CS or IT education looks like. Yeah. So from um, from sort of the perspective of a department or a professor trying to keep up with the latest trends and trying to innovate, what does that actually look like and how much control would they have over doing that? So let me speak to that one. So you usually you see that kind of innovation done in the form of elective classes or special topics. That's largely where that comes in. Now, sometimes those end up becoming permanent classes. Sometimes they don't. Uh, so usually, this starts off as a special topics class. If it runs well for a couple of semesters, it'll turn into a permanent class. Uh, that probably will be an elective, unless unless it gets rolled into one of these accrediting uh, accredita uh, either accreditation or curriculum guidelines. And of course, we've seen non-accredited programs. Yeah. Information security is a great example. So if someone feels like they can make money off of it, the college, they'll pull it out and make it a non-accredited program. And it really has no bearing on the real world whether or not it's accredited. Yeah. It's they, maybe a question that someone asks they, at they, an open house. They might seek NSA designation, but maybe they not might. too. So say a little bit more on that. So you're, what if you are a college looking to start in this area? Would you go the accreditation route? Would you go the thing you think is most useful to industry? Would you do something else? What would you do? So right now, I would go with the NSA designation. And the only reason I would do that is because that's what everybody has. Additionally, the accreditations aren't currently available. And even when they are available, I highly doubt that people are going to go that route because and, it costs additional money. And there's one other really good reason to go for that, too, is that it opens up grants for the college to apply to. There's actually a positive versus just spending yeah. money to get yeah. the title. Really, for ABET stuff, 
the P your market for being able to say you're ABET accredited are the parents of students. And when doing open houses, I have never had a single person ask me if a program is ABET accredited. I've, I've heard it once, and the answer was, well, we're NSA designated. And they're like, all right, that's good. <laughs> yeah, in fact, that probably has higher, higher recognition. Yeah. Any other questions? Excellent. Well, thank you guys very much.